are at the KTH, KTH Department of Architecture. Yes. Oh, you list up <laughs> all the time at Pfeiffer Lincoln. Oh, okay. Lots of times. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy to see you here again. And I hope you will come many times. Yes, yes. But please, I'll give uh, space for you. And uh, I hope we have your presentation. Sure. Yes. Thanks. I will try to use this. Is it on? It's on. Okay. It's a little bit better sound if the microphone is on the table for online speakers. Okay. The first slide. Okay. The summer. I don't know. I usually do view and then full screen. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I hope so. Mr. One? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I will say just a little shortly before I start a few things about myself. Uh, my name is Boyan Boric, and um, I lived in Sweden for about uh, almost 20 years. Uh, before that, I lived in the United States, in New York, for most of my adult life. And prior to, to that, I, I actually come originally from former Yugoslavia, uh, Belgrade, Serbia, today. And um, yeah, I mean, my life journey brought me, brought me here today. <laughs> I'll talk about this probably. Uh, that as a this is a cover of the book, uh, which is based on my PhD uh, dissertation from 2020, and it's based on the work in uh, I conducted in Kishinev in Moldavia or Moldova uh, for several years, maybe six seven years, where I spent a lot of time actually going back and forth between Stockholm and, and Kishinev. So. <clears throat> The book is called The Ghost Boulevard, and it really focuses, I'm talking about in general terms of post Soviet, but really focus on Kishinev and also kind of in relation to what happened with the public spaces uh, from the perspective of history and in relation to the present time, how we discuss our relation to the past in, in many ways, but also, um, um, you know, the processes of urban development and also. Um, have been very, very uh, powerful and really kind of brought up new powerful actors that have consumed a lot of public spaces in the city in the post Soviet period you know, since the 90s. And what kind of new practices and new ways to practice are emerging in this type of environment? We can switch. <clears throat> so, the Ghost Boulevard talks about. Um, partially kind of historic perspective on what happened in the post uh, World War II period, uh, when the city was devastated completely by, by the war. And um, the new plan emerged uh, that was drawn up by Alexis Kusha, architect, um, and his team. They come up with some kind of like a neoclassical plan almost for, for the city. The city was basically leveled during the war. Very little was left. But that which was left, you know, had quite a, quite some, some significance, especially when it becomes kind of rare. Almost. So there is a history of erasure of past, both by war, but also by different um, occupation of territories and ideologies that are kind of coming and trying to erase the previous periods. So what happened was that Alex Kusha claimed that even though it was it was uh, developed um, in a way, it was kind of visionary as well. But then over time, it is uh, kind of dissolved. Very little of that is realized. And new generations of architects were interpreting it in, in their own way, you know, and also based on the state and government agendas that emerged over time and, and of course over, over several decades. Um, the main the main uh, aspect of it is the full of Chilmara, which is passing through it, which is here, we built. With many, many, many buildings. But then another one, another aspect was this boulevard, which was later called um, uh, Boulevard de Cantonier. 
So this boiler, the Cantemir, was never really realized, but it always kind of remained uh, in, in plants and, and has kind of had many different manifestations over time. Sometimes it became a highway, sometimes it was more of a boulevard and so on, but it was never really built. And uh, in, the, uh, in the later times, uh, especially at the break of, of the Soviet Union, this unrealized boulevard, even though to say that after 30, 40 years, you know, not being completed, it almost was to go out. So what happened is that uh, in the new system that, that did emerge, the new kind of political economic system that maybe we can even call it the neoliberalism, um, you have a kind of appropriation of public spaces, of, of you know, structuring buildings, and you know, restructuring and very little control, almost a chaos. Um, the, the public authorities generate the general plan to kind of try to get some kind of order planning and kind of also project into the future to see how the city can be organized. And this uh, worldwide actually was retained. It was appropriated with this new plan as a kind of another important link passing through the city, and the plan was to realize. But then what happened was that the important thing to mention is that it's passing through a very sensitive area where large parts of the urban past is still there. And if you really look close, close, close at it, at its path, the boulevard, you would actually have to destroy a lot of the town, you know, parts of the town. They call it the kind of urban village um, with some, some significant architectural buildings, but also a lot of different local communities that still live there. And they really were not fully aware that this boulevard would even be built. So now it's being brought back uh, in, in, the, uh, in the late 90s, start of 2000. Uh, the general urban plan uh, is from 2007, when, which actually represents a legal document. Which means uh, sorry, would you please the microphone uh, but down? Some of, the, some of the civilians, some of the people from the local community together with some other art groups, and um, uh, historic organizations, they they um, decided that maybe this is not such a good idea, and they did put pressure on politicians. And in 2012, the new uh, land zoning plan was developed, which was rejected by the parliament. So now we have a situation when we have one official plan, which is legal, and another one which is illegal. And this brought a standstill to the entire planning of the city, actually. And then the question came up, so what now? So that's why it's called the Ghost Boulevard, in a way, because it has a presence, but also it exists in some kind of insecurity and lack of understanding what's legal, what's illegal, what should be done, what not, who decides, and so on. And the way it's presented, you can go on to the next the slides. Oh yeah, I'm very sorry. Would it be comfortable that like our audience on Zoom asks yeah, if possible to forget the comments? You know, I'll, I'll push louder. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, can you go to the next slide? Because I just want to interrupt me. Okay. Yeah, this slide's really about the context of Kishnia. I will continue talking about the boulevard. Uh, but just to talk about you know, the, um, Kishinev and Moldova, they're kind of on the way to the EU, uh, at least in, the, in, in their um, idea of the future, most of the people, I would think. But at the same time, they're kind of stuck in this limbo between the European Union and, and, and the rest of uh, the world. And um, Moldova is, is kind of placed in a very sensitive area between geopolitical forces in the world. So, and this is not only now, this has been historically like that, you know, with many shifting boundaries, with not defined identity, trying to assert identity and so on. So this is a picture for one of, you know, the day of, of, day of the city where they have this kind of, um, um, you know, very big festival with, with uh, a lot of different structures that are built and events and so on. And this, this event, you can see there is a flag of EU, but also Soviet buildings. <laughs> So it built buildings and the kind of big word Kishinev. So in, in the psyche, they are kind of incorporated in these different past in the world. 
that's that's in the past, but also possibly the future, you know, along another boulevard. So, and uh, this is the core. <clears throat> this is the old town, so-called town, and the boulevard is supposed to pass through. And these are different neighborhoods that have been developed uh, during the Soviet times, and they're growing far and uh, still they're still growing in different directions. And uh, another interesting and important aspect of the city is all these different. Uh, green, green inserts, green, uh, it's a very green city. And you know, the wise thing about that period, uh, you would say, the you know, Soviet plane was actually to incorporate a lot of green spaces. Uh, maybe even similar to green, green shale in Stockholm. Okay? And this is Mogola. <laughs> so um, if you could go to another, another slide. And this is what is, what's, what's been happening to the city and you know, this kind of environment of what's legal, what's illegal, but also with some kind of investment coming in from abroad and a lot of people moving out and then sending money, sending money home and investing back in their own country, uh, needing to invest in their real estate. Uh, in a lot of sort of historic area, historic districts, you have kind of concrete buildings all of a sudden popping up. Then you have, you can see this kind of a tower there. It's built actually on the land of the public park. So it was, uh, some, nobody knows how, who, but somehow they got a permit to build in the, in the middle of the public park. It just illustrates uh, that, that there is a kind of tendency to appropriate spaces of the public. <clears throat> Keep going. And disregard history. Keep going. But you see it on all different levels. Uh, we have kind of additions that people are building. Uh, <clears throat> the, the system of, let's say, the Soviet buildings, they were privatized. The individuals were buying their apartments, and then there's not enough money to maintain the buildings. And so they do their own part of the facade, which signifies uh, where they live, but also uh, it changes the entire, entire look of the city. Everybody is doing something on their own, by their own means, with any kind of support from outside. So this is done on a micro level. And then also on a micro level, you have a kind of street appropriation of lots of poverty and uh, you know, the inability for people to, to, to make a living and that brings them out on the street and selling and appropriating the streets. So this really changed the landscape of the city. You have a layer of formal city from, from the past, and then you have a kind of formal city that's sort of permeating every level, whether it's a street or whether it's a you know, uh, tall, tall building. This is a kind of Stalin era. <clears throat> this is a Stalin era. It looks like right now, little shops. And it really talks about the, the state of the society and also need for everybody to prosper and survive and so on. And then in that sense, the state also kind of gives up and also is unable to control that. But the, on the other level, the very powerful financial interests are taking advantage of the situation and you know, building these enormous uh, buildings, maybe where they shouldn't be. Continue. <clears throat> we continue. So, this is an image of the general urban plan in 2007. Uh, this is one of the visions that came in this later period. This is not a Soviet city. This is this is a kind of postmodern city of some sort. And um, <clears throat> the architects, the architects and planners in the city, they actually see places like Dubai, some other kind of global city with sort of enormous capital investment and so on, really as, as, as an image of what this place should be. Could be a warning sign also. You know, how do you develop this period of a Soviet period? Who is involved? And who has the power? How you get to the power position? The relation between the public and private interests, but also which public interests, whether it's for the local people, is it done to a democratic way, or is it done to some kind of schemes behind the door and, and you know, connections and uh, disregard of the, of the law? We can continue. <clears throat> So this is the path of the boulevard in the, in the center, in the old center of the city. You can see that there is a great pattern here. 
um, this grid pattern was actually existing from uh, the end of the, the, 19th, the 19th century. This is a size typical Russian size typical, I uh, would say, prototype for the regional capitals. They were sort of implemented with a lot of capitals and parts, but also government buildings and so on. And here you have the kind of a little bit less formal, more kind of meandering, circular, uh, uh, angular structures. This is an old city that nobody really, no, no new ideology, no new, new plan actually managed to somehow conquer and take over. This is where the boulevard is supposed to pass. So this is a place where you can sure you get lost in the streets and find a different type of fabric, very different than the kind of formal grid, which also contributed to a very interesting contrast. So as I mentioned before, there is quite a lot of interesting buildings here from the past, but also very important, let's say, communities and neighborhoods. There is also um, historic uh, remnants of Jewish history here, because the Jews actually were almost the majority in the beginning of the 20th century, and they were uh, kind of erased and destroyed in World War II. So there is also that kind of heritage here with small fragments and, and stories of parts of the history. These yellow dots were traced by this uh, art organization that I've been working closely with, they're called Bobberley. They're the ones who actually brought attention to this introduction of Bula, where they discovered there is a lot of reconstruction happening here along it. So the boulevard became, even though it doesn't exist, it, it, it became a generator of urban development because it's, it's, it's anticipated. So you, if you anticipate something, then you can actually act before it happens. Um, and this is the, the red lines that were drawn from the official documents. So this is the boulevard that, that permeates to that. Back here, and just kind of, kind of cuts through. Only two parts were built actually this one and this one. And the rest is really, in reality, uh, existing neighborhoods. So it's interesting also what happens in this area here that were not built. There's this kind of strange concrete area where there's also illegal structures built on top of it. So, I mean, here are some kind of solid towers, but also uh, new uh, casinos. And, and you know, appropriated buildings of conversion of hotels. Right. And this eventually leads to the airport. Uh, and this is the this is the document that's been rendered illegal. So I'm talking I'm talking about when I talk about ghosts, I talk about actually the red lines. I also talk about uh, the red lines of, of these documents that are haunting the city, but also as it passes through. As people realize that this is happening or this may happen, then also wakes up many, many actors. It also disturbs the, the, both the people in the ground and it also shakes up the power structures. You can go further. So ghost is actually not a metaphysical ghost, like you know, in a horror film or a story, but it's actually something that people create. It's created by the people, by their memory, by their imagination, by documents, by even buildings. So it materializes in many ways. So yes, here I talked about the, how this mapping actually of the city and understanding that in fact, it's the presence of, of this idea of the boulevard is actually activating a lot of construction on, on its way. We can change to it. Yeah, here is the, the city planning office in the municipality. This is a huge model for the last uh, plan for the city before the end of Soviet Union. And it's still sitting on the wall. You know, the, the, the two empty chairs and the table here are probably meant for, for somebody who comes in and makes a proposition and then sit, sit together with the city planner. But in the background is always this big plan. You know. It's still there. And then here, here we see the visions of Boulevard de Camille, uh, Boulevard de Camille actually is here. So this kind of by like architecture structures. This is the actual vision. This is actually a view from above where you use a drone, film it all over the building. This is one of the images that you can see that right? the Boulevard de Camille and then come to where it's not, which reflects this, where it's what it can be. 
And this is extract from the actual uh, regulatory documents to show the regulant to pass through. And then they enter this triangulated structure from the old urban area. There's some chat here. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so what the story culminates at this little triangle here, which is a park called Zykin Park, where the activists actually managed to, to congregate and try to stop oh, because that's funny. one very important public space for the local community, or became even more important because you know they saw it as a kind of you, you put a rock in somebody's shoe and you make it difficult to wear the shoes, or you put an obstacle on something and try to stop it at one point, right? Big problem. So, so this Zyke Park became like a really important focus of my work and research and all these different people that I encountered that were involved. They were trying to pass, they were trying to preserve the park in many ways and, and, you know, and other types of uh, uh, actors emerged. Interestingly enough, this red line here, the passes through the park is actually, even though there is no road here, cars are passing through the park, which is amazing too. You know, I thought, well, how can you get so it? It's almost very strange, ghastly uh, coincidence that it's already becoming a boulevard. You know, the passing through it became this form of dirt road that municipality accepted. It changed life. I'm almost finished. I know the time is short. <laughs> yeah, I think we're out. So we have to. We have to yes. Yeah. You change it. Yes. So, so uh, it grew properly. First, identify all the Karnataka, but they're actually using now, they become, in, in a strange way, the, the, the thread lines of the boulevard gave them a lot of power because over time they managed to establish their position with the municipality and with, with the people. So they became kind of began the role of an urban planner uh, because they were able to attract the attention both of the local uh, community and people who live around, but also the municipality understood that nothing can be done without them and without the local people, which also speaks to kind of activism and democratic engagement in development of the city and helping you know, not only preserve public spaces, but also improve them and find a good way. So this is an approved document that they're using that's actually legal that will help them preserve the park in the community. And also, yeah, the process I, I was dealing with everybody on every level from all different uh, walks of life, people who are involved in these discussions. Um, there were a couple of lectures before about memory and management. I will not, uh, uh, something I call memory management. Sorry, you can go, Brian, you can go. Have to uh, let, yeah. Let's look at like this point tomorrow. Yes. We can continue. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure I'll be here tomorrow. Let me just finish with the last slide. You can skip over the next one. This one? No, you can skip down. So this one shows actually the kind of activism, or many different types of activism. For example, to stop the road, people were setting up the picnics, picnic table, and made it very strange for somebody to drive a car. You actually uh, make the sheet dirty. Uh, and there were different types of structures. There were events and so on. And, and later, they built a little more uh, formal structure. Here you can see actually Thank you very much.